You're listening to part two of a Dear Applicants podcast episode. Check out last week's episode to listen to part one of this interview. At the time you were doing the first part, right? More of that legal work. This is when you were in Cambridge. Yeah. Do you feel as though you were always drawn to that sort of work? This is something that came naturally to you. We'll get to medicine a bit later because, of course, chronologically, mm. also mm. That, was, that was further down the line. At the time, was it something that was natural? It was natural, but not considered. It was a natural but not consider, not well considered decision. So to expand a little bit on that, yes. uh, <laughs> to ex- expand a little bit on that, the whole genesis of me studying law was it, it came more as a more as a byproduct of my secondary school years rather than a rather than something that you know I was envisioning since I was five or something that I got out of watching Law and Order and living the Singapore dream. Ah, uh, yeah, you could say that in some ways and maybe not in others. But <laughs> but but essentially, I think going back to what I said just now, you know, I was a very much a humanities inclined student, and this is coupled with the fact that in 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 my high school in Hua Chong, there's a very strong culture of uh, having students go to university in the UK and especially especially, especially the Oxford Bridge sure. Unis. I think I think they marketed themselves once as Ethan of the East. I don't know how I don't know how I feel about that tagline. I but mean for years, <laughs> for years the Oxbridge tests used to happen yeah. at Hua Chong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean when you speak to any of our parents you mm. speak to that went to Oxbridge back in or Cambridge specifically, yeah. but Oxbridge in the 80s or 90s, mm. they'll tell you they went to Hua Chong to the test. Yeah, yeah. So I think extrinsically, there are very much these factors that kind of just nudged me in that direction. And I think I received some, I'm grateful to have received some very strong support Mm -hmm. from my peers as well as my seniors in terms of, you know, navigating, (coughs) navigating the application process knowing what to do. So it just felt like something that was within the, within the comfort zone. So, yeah, give me a second. Yeah, yeah, we can take a pause. Hmm. Yeah, it felt very much like something that was within the comfort zone. And I mean, it's not that I didn't give it a thought at all. I thought about how uh, at that point, perhaps I really wasn't sure of what I wanted to do in the future. That I'll admit. Um, so to, to anyone who's a JC student or 17 or 18 years old out there, it's it's not it's not the end of the world if you don't uh, know something that you absolutely must do by the time you graduate from uni. But at that point, I wasn't that sure. But then I did give a thought to a few things. I thought that law was something that was within my capabilities perhaps mm-hmm. in terms of writing ability um, in terms of my inclination towards language and the written word and at the same time uh, from speaking to people knowing that it's something that would broaden my horizons and allow me mobility into a whole variety of fields in future so with that in my pocket then I set sail across the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> on a Qantas flight and, yeah, yeah. and and so that was my decision to go in how many fails did I have <laughs> I, no, so, no. so with law, yeah. I guess like, law isn't really a vocational degree, right? Yeah. It's very yeah. much an academic one yeah. that, that can be uber academic or yes, a little bit more absolutely. practical, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so uh, uh, did you feel as though you had that, okay, this is something that I can do as a foundation and then I can mm. go in a mo- bunch of different places or, or were you like, okay, I think I'm going to practice law at that time? I think yes and no. Um, yes, because... I do believe law has given me a lot of foundational skills mm-hmm. that uh, that I still carry with me today. Uh, that you know, sometimes in, in some other subjects you may not get as much of. Not that you don't get any at all. I think, for example, <coughs> thinking in a very systematic way is something that law very much instilled in me. So I, I I like to tell a lot of my students who are considering studying law is that law is the most sciencey of the humanities, right. short of actually studying science because you do a lot of things you think in the form of algorithms a lot of the time you know you it's, just look it's, at the Yelnat questions yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so it's it's like you know it's, it's something a murder there's element one element two element three and four and if element two is fulfilled then we go on to 2a and 2b is a of fulfilled or b fulfilled if it's not then you downgrade it to the next mm. crime that's sort of a, that's sort of an idea so that's something that i i, I think has really provided a good foundation for me to think systematically about issues. And even in general, when I'm doing things like presenting to my superiors or uh, writing up a document, even tiny things like that, very general things, it makes me think in a much more systematic way. I think also writing is something that you carry with you everywhere. Writing a cover letter, uh, writing a job application, writing an opinion piece. I think 
law was something that really paid a lot of attention to detail in what you write and what you what comes out of your mouth. You can't it can't just be be fluff, you know. So I think those are very transferable skills. No, at the same time, because I think there's a very big distinction to be made between what's what's to be studied in law at university and how law is practiced. And I think that's something that was impressed upon us very continuously, both by our academic mentors as well as our professional mentors in our internships and everything like that. So it's, it's made very... And I think, okay, maybe there's a bit of a cultural difference between how law is taught in locally and how it's taught in the UK. In the UK, it's very much uh, uh, seen as an academic foundation, yeah. much as any Especially other Especially at like is. Oxford and Cambridge. Correct, right? exactly. And, and, and so that's, that's exactly why it translates into industry practice which is that if even if you don't take a law degree you can take the graduate diploma in law mm-hmm. for just a year and your career progression will be the same as someone who has a law degree whereas in Singapore they have very it's a much more professionally oriented degree still is so but but going back to to what I think I felt about my law degree was that it definitely taught me foundational legal skills like how to do research how to interpret cases and how to put forth a point but lots of things that I learned across my internship so that or rather that I was exposed to are very different. It's about things like having an awareness of the commercial landscape, about how to integrate the viewpoints of different different parties and clients and having an eye for the business field. It's about things like knowing, it's like, it's not just about knowing how, knowing specific areas of law. It's about applying the foundational legal skills you have to perhaps completely new areas like a merger and acquisition or like regulatory law, things that you may not have encountered before. And that's something that you continue to develop throughout your legal career. So I think yes and no. Yes, because the the law degree did give, give me a lot of very important foundational skills. No, because I think as with any degree, there's a dissonance between, there will necessarily be a dissonance between what you learn academically and what you learn professionally and one cannot have, cannot, cannot exist without the other. With the other. Got it. Yeah. I, I hate to circle back from our carefully constructed sure, timeline, sure. but you had briefly alluded to the fact that you were lucky enough to have the support of yeah. friends and, and a couple mentors around. What was the application process to Cambridge like? Mm. So the application process for Cambridge was, it came in a few a few steps. Mm. So first of all, you have your Personal Bef- statement, yeah, you have your personal tests, statement, yeah. test, and all that. So, but before you even get started, you need to have your predicted grades, right? So, I think that's where most people are not aware the ball kind of starts rolling already. The fact that you need a certain set of predicted grades to even be considered in the pool, and that's where the school stepped in very much because in the humanities program, we got very good support from that. Our mm. our teachers were all uh, they all came from the UK. They have years of experience with the Oxbridge system, so they already have predicted. Grades. Is there something Chi Han was saying as well? Yeah, they there. already predict the grades for us. They already even help us select colleges and we just uh, kind of go there. So it takes off a lot of the cognitive load. Mm. And moving on from there, we have our personal statement and then we start writing it up. So that's by... yeah. So we'll pause there because a lot mm. of people don't really understand what the personal statement's about. Mm. What, what were you writing? So I'm not going to lead you anywhere, right? But oh, what of were course, you, of course. What were you... What were you writing about in the personal statement? Or what do you think the personal statement is to you, having done it yourself, Mm -hmm. having mentored students? What's the point of it? So I think in a sentence, a personal statement essentially is showcasing or rather selling yourself as a student of the subject. Mm -hmm. Of the subject. Of the subject, yes, in the UK. That is what I always tell my students because lots of people think a personal statement is a life story. A lot of people think a personal statement is a list of extracurriculars that has explanations, but it's not. For the UCA statement specifically, it is an exposition of what you know and what you like about the subject. Mm-hmm. And that translates into how attractive of a future student you are. To and the so what were the kinds of things that you talked about? So I talked about a few different areas. So one of them was essentially... I have to caveat that, you know, lots of these things, uh, how, how the personal statement generally reads, at least for you, Cass, is that you start with a hook that can come from any of your life experiences, something you've read, something you've done. But a lot of it is from 
the takeaways you get from your own reading. So let's say one of the things I wrote about was international law and how it functions. That was I, I what kind of made me read more into it was my model UN model UN experience, and that made me probe a little bit more into the workings of international law and the issues that came about. I think I remember weaving that in with some of the geopolitical knowledge I had about Southeast Asia at the time as well, because I think history history was something I was quite interested in. I, I quite like the subject. Um, what else I wrote about was I wrote a little bit about military law in Singapore. Okay. So I, I I was thinking in my head, I didn't want it to read like a very sort of typical, or oh, I talk about I talk about international law because I did model UN. Yes. I do criminal law because I think criminal law is interesting and that's why everyone thinks the law is before they go to uni. And I'm going to write a little bit about tort law because that's you're quite You're quite wary of not yeah. repeating yeah. the same stuff that mm. everybody shovels. Absolutely, into. absolutely. So I think there was some sort of uh, military case going around at the time in the street times that was relating to uh i think a liability for the death of a serviceman something like that okay yeah it was, it was something to do with that and then it was some and then the, the the analysis that i wrote was something about the uh the immunity of government bodies against liability for certain certain actions something to that effect so i did a bit of reading about case law and just debated what were the issues surrounding that so i think that was that was basically how my personal statement sounded. It's it's quite academic, as most UK statements are. Did you have things yeah. like, uh, well, internships, summer programs, anything like that? A lot of people seem to think that that's what matters, right? Mm, um, no, not really. A stamp actually. of a law firm no, on your CV, no? No, absolutely not. I think I think I was I was fretting about it for a while. I have to. I was fretting about it for a while because there's lots of my peers who, you know, before university, during um, maybe after NS, before NS, they have a uh, un aunties, uncles, cousins, friend who owns a law firm somewhere, and then they go there and drink coffee for two weeks, and then they get a law firm name on their CV, right? So, so I was very, I was kind of fretting that I didn't have that. But in actual fact, he's, he's just talking it, about my. <laughs> High school life. No. <laughs> my mother, my, yeah. my mother acted in a my mother acted in a production of Greece with this lawyer and who by Ooh. the time I was in high school wasn't practicing anymore, but her husband mm. was very much was they're here in Singapore now. And so I would just follow him around yeah. in court, right? For two, for like it was two different summers. So I when I applied mm. to college, I was like, I put it at the top and then my interviewers didn't care. They didn't ask me a single thing about the internships yeah. and they just asked about everything else. And I was like, but but the internships yeah. and they were like, no, no, that's fine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I think I think one thing that really reassured me was okay. Two things that really reassured me was number one, the lots of my seniors and lots of people who are already studying, lots of people in the street told me mm -hmm. that honestly, it's not really about the brand name because again, to think about your million dollar question, your bottom line, which is that this is a statement that's selling you as a student. Yeah. So selling you as a student of the law. What matters a lot more is the thought processes and the fact that you can substantiate your passion or aptitude for the subject. And yes, an internship is one way to say that I was interested and pursued my interest further. But then if there isn't any substance to what you did in the internship or how you decided to pursue it, that is infinitely less of less value than if you had a topic that you saw just in the news or just in your own reading and you decide to chase it down and you formulated your own thoughts on so it. Basically, so basically they don't care about your well-connected auntie. They uh, care yeah, about yeah, they don't really care your about your passion for the subject. Auntie. Correct, okay. correct. And I think the other thing that really reassured me was that at the yeah, at the end of the day, there are lots of people who didn't have those things and, and got in as well. And conversely, there are so many people who, who have, have brand them. names on them. So that doesn't necessarily make them Do you think, well, yeah. maybe this is a, a, a rough question yeah. because you're not an admissions tutor, but do you think admissions tutors are getting more and more wary of individuals that sort of, those are the hallmarks of the mm. application brand names? No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's, it's a trend. And uh, I mean, right now with, with Ivy Prep, I'm not doing a lot of, it's it's not the predominant part of my portfolio to be doing uni admissions consulting, but right. previously for the past two years, I've had experience with that for an, an, another organization. And I think increasingly you do pick up on that. And your, your role as an admissions tutor is increasingly challenging in a sense that you have to kind of help tease out their uniqueness as an individual instead of helping them to, to kind of help them undefixate themselves on the fact that oh, I did an internship, so I must talk about it, that sort of thing. If they did an internship, they loved it and they got something out of it, sure. But they it's a challenge to kind of help the applicants realize that that is not the be-all and end-all. 
then I guess yeah. also you gotta have to be you have, have to be careful that the internship you're doing is yeah is something that is quite unique. Yeah. And not something yeah. that 20 other students from your school are doing. Yeah. Right? They're not going to have yeah. the same thing on paper. Before we continue, I would like to take a quick break to remind you to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps us improve and to reach a wider audience to provide further insight into this arduous journey. Also, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to email us at our email linked in the description below. We'd love to hear from you. How do you explain... So, so I think your philosophy mm-hmm. of working with students um, through Ivy Prep or, or even before is, is, I guess it's quite influenced by your own journey of growth, right? But how do yeah. you explain that philosophy to parents, especially, and, and I mean, I think mm-hmm. it's a pan-Asian context where, you know, even in back home in India, people think you need those certificates and you need those titles. So how do you explain the more, um, some might call it fluffy, I'd call it organic mm-hmm. philosophy to to parents and students? Well, I think first off, I explain to them some very, in, in very practical, concrete terms, that that is exactly what the university admissions process shows. Mm-hmm. Because no longer in this day and age is it like in, in our parents' time where you submit a CCA list and a bunch of hours and all that, and then they just like choose the one with the, you chose the gold Olympiad medalist instead of the silver Olympiad medalist and that kind of thing. You have interviews, you have longer and longer application essays, more and more open-ended questions. You have interviews, you have multi-modality interviews, especially for things like medicine. Yeah. You have these very, very targeted interviews. You have these assessment centers and all that. And that is exactly what those things are meant to tease out of you. They're meant to look beneath the surface of those titles and see if there's any substance there. That's the first thing I tell them. Because if you think that the the titles are all that they need, then why bother talking to grilling your student for one hour by two different people who have seen 10,000 students exactly like them before? And I mean, especially yeah. for Oxford and Cambridge, right? And you know, yeah. Maybe if you're applying, well, that's yeah. Oxford and Cambridge, but also if you're applying for your engineering, material science at Imperial. Yeah those titles aren't going to get you anywhere in the interview, yeah, right? Absolutely. You're going to be found out absolutely. pretty quickly. Absolutely. And so the guy yeah. who interviewed you, um, they well, they had flown down, right? That was the yeah. international panel. Was he a law professor as well? He wasn't a law professor, okay. but he still asked me quite a few legal questions. Okay. So to really, and, and I think funnily enough, I found it challenging because he asked me very basic found fundamental questions about the legal topics that I was talking about. So it wasn't about, you know, uh, the things I wrote about specifically. So I would be able to just, you know, regurgitate and sort of embellish whatever I wrote already. He asked me something that was as simple as, okay, so what is international law? What is it? And why does it work? So those are, those were really, I'm glad I did my reading because if I didn't, I, I couldn't just rattle off a definition and tell him this is what I understand of it and these are the principles at play and I couldn't outline the fundamental debates, then it would have shown right away. So I would say that, I would, I would say that in these interviews, they really want to understand what goes on in your mind. And whatever you have done or not done in the past few years is left at the door. And in that moment, really, your your caliber as an applicant it really shows. Yeah. Hmm. And do you feel as though so when you did the, did you mm-hmm. have another round of interviews for when you switched to medicine as well? Uh, yes, yes. I did. And I so did. how different were those interviews? Do you feel as though they were looking for the same kinds of things? Yes and no. Yes, okay. because they do want you to understand specific subject knowledge, right? right? So, so, but then, not to be fair, but then you were yeah. applying to Duke and US, which is different for undergrad undergrad men, right? Would yeah. they have asked the same questions? That um, I think level? some broadly similar questions okay. for sure. Um, I'm. I think one yes because they ask you for content knowledge because mm. they ask me things like okay what do you think are the most major issues facing healthcare in Singapore that sort of thing. Oh okay, uh, but they were yeah. more sort of big picture. Yeah, issues. because I mean I think for for things like like medicine they can ask you some content specific questions, but. They also can't ask you, oh, I have yeah, a patient presenting like, with chest pain for two days. Yeah. Can you please tell me what you're going to do next? You know, it's, it's a bit yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, a, of an ask. So, so, but no, also, because I think for medicine, they are also a little bit more concerned about you as an individual, because I guess medicine puts you in a specific position of power and privilege. Uh, 
it's it's a very unique human relationship yeah. that you are placed into, and they really want to see your character, why you do certain things, uh, what things get you going, and what things are your weaknesses. So there's a lot more of those character type questions as well that okay. you have to answer. I remember one of my uh, application essays was supposed to be an essay that answered the question, "What name one instance of adversity that you encountered?" and 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 tell me about it. Yeah. What did you write about? Oh, I wrote about my cave diving experience in Thailand. I, I you so, get stuck. Yeah, yeah, it was quite. It was you got quite stuck. Uh, no, I didn't get stuck. Oh. I didn't get stuck, but it was a pretty scary experience. If if I was stuck, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Uh, I so, <laughs> yeah, miraculous rescue. No, 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 it wasn't that. It wasn't that miraculous. Some but, ripped Aussie guy comes and saves everybody. No, no, the the the, the Danish guy who helped me uh. out was also was not very ripped, but he's okay, very good, right. excellent diver. So so I think the experience I wrote about was actually I I went for like a like a introductory cave diving course. So I'm I'm not like one of those people who can dive into the cave and save. Thai football team that is not I'm not that kind of diver but it's like it's like it's like an introductory course because because cave diving is a thing by the way it's like a yeah, hobby yeah, yeah. Oh, people yeah, do for way. fun despite the many deaths it produces every year uh, it's kind of yeah kind of the thing that I really enjoyed so, why do people climb Mount Everest right yeah exactly so so I went for this introductory course and we were in the jungles of Thailand and then on the last day of the course there was this bunch of villagers that came up so so we were we just got off a truck in our scuba equipment and everything with our tanks and then this bunch of villagers came to us and then they started speaking Thai to us because this was like in a really like in a forest somewhere and my 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 coach was my, my instructor is like he lived in Thailand for quite a few years so he can kind of understand a little bit so what he understood from them is that they need help picking up something from a cave that we normally don't dive in like it's a completely unexplored cave mm. and they are doing some sort of worship ritual thing there and then they drop something important and we just have to go in and look for it and then my instructor thought it was human sacrifice man. yeah I thought no, it was a great idea to bring me on day 4 of my course to just jump in together with him and start rummaging for something that we didn't even know what it really was so basically we just went or hit. something over there yeah yeah we, know, we literally just dive head first into this Thai spirit cave with the understanding that I'm supposed to look for something that doesn't that looks out of place and just let him know when it's there and then at some point I, I kicked up a lot of a lot of mud so so the thing about cave diving is that the minute you touch the bottom everything goes black like like because Literally as if you're blindfolded. And I didn't dress that because I wasn't a very good diver at the time. And then so I was really panicking for five solid minutes because I didn't feel him touch me. I didn't know where he is. I know that there's nothing but rock above me. So there's I can't surface anywhere. So I was just kind of hovering there, waiting to die. But then, yeah, he got me out. Uh, <laughs> and with some, with some quick thinking, we managed to find our way out again. But did you find what you were looking for? No, apparently there was nothing. They were just there was a miscommunication. So so no one knows exactly why they got us in at the end of the day. Are you, are you on Reddit? This sounds like one of those no yeah. sleep stories. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah, it is. Random, it is like it the, is. one of the few Asian stories that yeah. pop up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but so, uh, just... Uh, so, so just in the interest of time, <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm very interested in this, sure. but, but I think what a lot of people would love to hear about, mm. um, or myself included, to be honest, mm. is the switch from law to yeah. medicine. Yeah. Uh, why? What what was the what what inputs were there? Mm. What led to that decision? Was there any pushback? Mm. And where are you today? Sure. So that I have this question. I've probably been asked about a hundred oh, times. I can imagine. Yeah. And I've repackaged and repackaged this time and again. But I realized nothing quite does justice to the chaos that went on in my head at the time. But I will try my best anyway. So so, so normally I, I tell people that it's kind of divided into both push and pull factors. So push factors meaning um the things that made me realize that a legal career wasn't really what I wanted to pursue in the end. So when I went into law school, I I don't think it was a bad academic experience. It was an amazing time at Cambridge. I met great people. Faculty were great. I did some internships and people, you know, contrary to most stereotypes, lots of the lawyers I met are really nice people and they do genuinely interesting, pretty groundbreaking work. Uh, we work with some of them, right? Yeah, <laughs> we do. And, 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 and at the same time, despite how great it was, I realized that this isn't really something I could see myself doing for mm. the next few years of my life. I even tried, you know, thinking about other ways outside of private practice that I, I would be applying my law degree. So, so you, you've done the uni internships and all yeah, that. Right? Yeah, I did local firms, overseas firms, Hong Kong firms. Yeah, I can see the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I even did an internship with the uh, commercial affairs department in the police force here. The, it's, it's like the white collar crime department. And I was oh, like, okay. yeah, I was like, oh, um, actually the public sector also so it's not something that particularly makes me more interested anyway so so i started looking around thrashing around for um new career choices so between my i'd say between my between the 
the immediate the immediate hobby love, which was which was setting up a dive shop in Thailand and disappearing mm-hmm. for the rest of my life. And the more background thing, which was oh healthcare and medicine, I went with healthcare and medicine. So okay. then we come to the pull factors. So I think medicine, the whole journey to the day I decided I want to do medicine was a very, uh, it was a gradual journey. So the very first time the idea of medicine got implanted in my head was when I served my NS. So very serendipitous. I was, I be, I was allocated to become a medic during NS and I did the dental assisting thing. So, so before that, I had no intention of exploring healthcare, no intention of being a doctor because uh, especially, you know, in school, it's all the good science students go do medicine. Good. And I was anything but a good science student. So then last thing on my mind. But then with that actual experience clinically, um, seeing blood, teeth, bone, uh, assisting on ops, cutting sutures, uh, uh, dealing with patients for the first time, I actually quite enjoyed it. Uh, Learned how to set an IV plug, learned how to give injections and uh, knew how badly it can go wrong sometimes. Uh, Then I was, I I thought it was kind of interesting. You were telling, I think, Hmm. a student the other day that uh, that was the first time you'd seen bone and sort of someone else's blood and correct. you were like can I, can correct, correct. yeah so I was a lot less grossed out than I thought yeah. I would be so that was the first the really the first yeah. thought in my head and moving on from there I mean again NS is always a fever dream right so I thought it would just be left in the past but then moving on from there I think as I was looking for you know you could call it a new calling how cheesy but looking for a new calling I was I, I was inspired by the idea of healthcare because when I was interacting with the migrant workers both in a clinical and non-clinical setting mm-hmm. I think when you have someone with a physical ailment who is looking out, who needs help with it, I think you being a physician puts you in this very uniquely human position of applying this absolutely uncertain science to alleviate something that is really bothering someone. And I think there's something very very intimate about that encounter and something that's deeply personal that really resonated with me. And so moving on from there, then I explored my interest a little bit more, you know, because that's just the answer for why healthcare. It's not the answer for why medicine. And so moving on from there, I explored other things. Do I enjoy the science of clinical medicine? Hence my shadowing opportunities, hence my clinic internship to see if, you know, is, is being a physician the right role for me as opposed to other positions in healthcare to see if I like the science of medicine as well. And I realized I did. So moving on with that, then I decided to explore healthcare more broadly as well. So at university, I was involved in certain activities that kind of had a healthcare aspect to it. So in terms of policy, policy involvement wise, I did, uh, I was involved with a global health interest group in university in Cambridge. So I wrote one or two, we had two policy papers about digital health, one about the NHS and its main policy issues. I wrote another, I wrote two pieces which were separate to that. So from a more legal perspective, I wrote my undergrad dissertation about the PDPA and its relation to healthcare data because I know that operationally it's something that is always lingering in the background and from a legal point of view PDPA was it's a very new thing right so I decided to write about it and at the same time I also wrote about uh, the state of how healthcare law and regulation governs advanced practitioner advanced nurse practitioners in the UK because there's this whole thing about you know nurses can actually do a lot more than just what they were perceived to be decades ago and this but then the, the the body of policies and rules hasn't quite kept up so I wrote something about that and outside of that I also was in a management consulting project for a healthcare startup so they were pioneering this device that can sort of help with Parkinson tremors it's just a patch you stick on and miraculously the tremors go away you know something like that so we did a bit of a from a more commercial angle we did a project with them. So I think that also made me realize that, okay, uh, A, I like healthcare. B, I like clinical medicine from a doctor's point of view. And then thirdly, I'm interested in the healthcare scene in general. So tick box, tick box, tick box. And then I went on to do my entry test and I realized that, okay, I'm not going to completely flunk out. I attained a decent score. And then I was through to this new phase of my life. And right now, uh, I'm I've, I'm about a year through my first set of clinical attachments, and I'm I'm about halfway through my course right now. Yeah, I have no other questions. I think it's a completely autonomous interviewee. <laughs> uh, no, but thank you for that. I think it was an interest, an incredibly interesting journey of that mm-hmm. sort of transition from law to to medicine, but also. I think there were quite a lot of milestones that you yeah. hit that weren't necessarily laid out beforehand, but I think that yeah. it pushed, oh, well, I guess you use the word pull, right? The sort of pull factors that 
that led you to this new calling of yours that figured out it wasn't just the practical element, but also the larger, um, let's say, policy stuff about medicine that, that you, you were interested in. We are, we are going to have to bring this to a close shortly, mm -hmm. but before then, uh, is there any, well, I guess, I mean, you work closely with students, so if anyone watching rings in, we'd be able to arrange a meeting <laughs> with you, but, but uh, till then, is there anything that you'd like to leave our viewers and listeners with? I think to students, mm -hmm. most of the time, I think my, my main, the main takeaway I would like to leave to them is that creating your story is not something that happens overnight. It's a combination of serendipity and intentionality. Neither can exist without the other. If we just leave things completely to chance, we won't get anywhere. At the same time, at, at the same time, you don't have to be 100% intentional about everything. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of the things I did had a specific goal with landing me at the place I am today. But it has to be a combination of the two. Because if you go about cruising along uh, and not thinking about where things will potentially lead you, then you're just not going to end up, you're not going to end up in any way you're particularly fulfilled. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't need to force yourself to commit to a certain ambition or aspiration. But where those two things combine is, I can call it organized chaos, in, in that, in the matrix. first of all, at the very start, when we go about things, even if we're just exploring them, even if we're thinking about it for fun, think about where, what are the doors it can open for you? Even if it doesn't lead you to a specific place that you want, think about where are the different paths it can lead you. And on hindsight also, think about how all those things form a narrative together because things that are otherwise unrelated can, can suddenly become, you know, they can all suddenly come together in a way that you don't really realize. I mean, one of my great examples is about how I decided I actually like the science of medicine. That's a combination of me, uh, me, me having to poke IVs every week into my bunk mate, a combination of me being a personal trainer and having to learn a bit about anatomy and learning about the names of some muscles, about implementing progress and seeing people get, you know, better health in terms of health, a combination of me having a passion for the people I volunteered for and a combination of me looking into larger issues from a more academic perspective. And I cannot say for a fact that I planned this all out from day one. It doesn't but, sound like you did, no. <laughs> and, and, but at a point in time, there has to be coherence that mm. comes to it. So I would say, for lack of a better word, organized chaos. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that word and the longer explanation. And of course, thank you very much for your time. Mm. Isaac sounds like he has a lot more to share, so I think it's worth bringing you back for a more <laughs> sure. med-specific <laughs> discussion, no given problem. that we went into so many tangents no about law and profile building and stuff like that. But uh, thank you guys for dialing in uh, to this episode and stay tuned, follow us wherever, wherever we're posting things. And in importantly, Isaac and I work very, very closely together with students and parents. So if you are interested in our support with well, more hands-on profile building, uh, reach out, you'll be able to ask this guy all your questions directly. So thank you and stay tuned. That's all for today's episode of Dear Applicants. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you found the content valuable and insightful. If you'd like to learn more about our guests or the topics we discussed, be sure to check out our show notes for links and further resources.